Welcome to the first uh, trading day in February. I am Bosin Damofaye and welcome to the show today. Joshua Debisi, the head of banking analysis at uh, Vetiva Capital, Alikan Sachu in Nairobi, the CEO and founder of uh, Rich Frontiers Management, and one of our analysts and show anchor, Temple Lashaju. Good morning, gentlemen. Hope you had a great weekend. Morning, boss. Morning, boss. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's uh, uh, run you through the equities market, a bit of a selection that we do on a daily basis. Nigerian market roared 3.40% to knock off the month of January in a very positive 33. Kenya uh, came in at 1.60% positive. The Ivorian market, the Egyptian top 30, and the South African market dipped 1.16%. South Africa's market declined, understandable because of its correlation with the emerging markets downturn that we saw between uh, Wednesday and Friday last week. Let's check in with the big story within the East African community. Projects financing in Africa, about $30.07 billion last year, according to a report by uh, a UK uh, agency uh, saying that the uh, French uh, did the biggest chunk of projects on the continent with the Mozambique. LNG project, $22.6 billion, led by Total Fina of France as the top of the league. Uh, BOC Kenya PLC Kabasid is as okay the acquisition of 100% of uh, that particular in that transaction. And East African breweries, the ending season is here. It looks like, well, the COVID 19 pandemic hit the la East Africa's largest brewer, brewing company listed in about three uh, exchanges in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. A merge exchange on the island of Seychelles has suspended the listing of China Lijuan International Holdings. Ali, let's drink to the EABL earnings, shall we? Yes, uh, so East African breweries, majority owned by Diageo, um, one of the flagship uh, uh, companies of Nairobi Securities Exchange, its flagship beer, Tuscalaga, I'm sure, I'm sure most people. Um, uh, have tried it or invited it. Um, it's very, very popular. Um, and they released their first half results on Friday morning. Um, uh, look, the headline numbers are uh, down 47%, uh, obviously caught everyone's attention. And that's because the comparison was with the previous half year, um, pre-COVID uh, situation, um, so, you know, you were comparing uh, uh, apples and oranges. You know, you had a completely different scenario in this reporting period, though it wasn't as bad as the previous. Um, if you look at it sequentially, there was an improvement um, in earnings. What was interesting, Kenya was obviously down. You've had this perfume from 9 p.m. It's reduced consumption. It's taken people back home. They're drinking at home, but not at the same scale that they would if they're out and about. So when I, and Tanzania and Uganda actually posted positive growth, which was interesting. Um, Tanzania, of course, has had a more laissez-faire attitude towards uh, the virus and is calling it pneumonia, not COVID. Um, and I think, therefore, that's why you had that uh, outperformance in, in the regional uh, countries. Uh, overall, I think uh, this wasn't bad, frankly, given the circumstances. I think uh, if you look at it sequentially, um, it, it, it's quite positive in point of fact. And I, for one, think you know it's a share to pick up if it dips any further. If you've got an 18-month or 24-month outlook and you can look through the viral noise and say to yourself, this is a real blue chip company, um, we've got demographic growth, million new customers in Kenya every year, a million in Tanzania, a little bit less in Uganda. You've got a lot of growth momentum there. And once this thing gets back to normal, you're going to see, I think, a very good performance. So you've got to look at it uh, through the noise and, and look ahead. But uh, it looks interesting at the moment. Um, your other reports, uh, uh, project finance, interesting. Macron, um, uh, top of the list, France, uh, obviously the Total, as you mentioned, project in Cabo Delgado, of course, there have been, there's been tremendous uh, uncertainty uh, because of the insurgency that we're witnessing in Cabo Delgado and a few weeks ago, uh, Total evacuated uh, many of its workers 
But this remains, you know, the biggest gas project uh, since Qatar, um, and therefore, if it does stabilize, it will be it, it will be a, a multi-billion-dollar uh, story. But I think my takeaway about France is that you know France has made a, a very deliberate effort to uh, push out of Francophone Africa into Francophone Africa, and here in this case to Lusophone Africa. Um, and one needs to keep an eye on them because they're really making a big push. It's investment driven. Um, and uh, here in Kenya, we've seen a lot of investment, things like renewable energy, private equity firms staking, staking Nivas, supermarkets. So quite an interesting portfolio is being developed there. Um, and your final story, which was about the Seychelles merge exchange, it's interesting that Seychelles is probably close to, by the way, vaccinating nearly its entire population. Of course, the population is quite small, about 100,000, but uh, it will be an interesting sentinel society to keep an eye on. Merge Exchange, I think, you know, have been very bold and innovative and have tried to be at the cutting edge of listings that were doing some stuff on cryptocurrencies and other things. Um, but I think what that does mean is you're going to get situations where you probably uh, were a bit fast and loose and therefore have got to take very fast decisions. And my takeaway from this decision is that they are ready to do that. And uh, I, for one, would suggest people keep an eye on them um, because they're really trying to be innovative and at the cutting edge. Mm. Thank you, Ali, for the East African footprint uh, coverage. And Nigeria's got a whole lot to, to talk about. So our earnings started coming through last week with uh, FBN holdings. Uh, we've got a few from the non-bank sector, such as Guinness Nigeria. Echo Bank also reported full year 20 revenue up 7%. Gross earnings down very slightly. Uh, and ATEL also reported its uh, uh, Pan-African uh, coverage. Nigeria bringing 21.6% to the table. East Africa reporting 23.4%. Francophone, French-speaking Africa about contributing about 8% to the revenue growth in the nine months to, to the end of December last year for ATEL Africa. Uh, for PwC Nigeria, 10 o'clock this morning, the Roundtable on Finance Act and Economic Outlook for 20. 21. Let me uh, cross very quickly to Joshua uh, to give us your sense of what this uh, uh, FBN holdings, cutting razor earnings, mean for the rest of Nigeria's banking industry reporting season. Well, I think, first of all, it would be very difficult to use FBN as a sort of benchmark to measure or to sort of estimate where all the other tier one um, banks will come in, simply due to the fact that, you know, FBN is in very special circumstances, I mean, their MPLs are the highest of any tier one bank. Um, they declared, um, you know, loan loss provisions of about 50, 51 billion naira for the for the full year of 2020. So, so I don't think there's any any other tier one bank that will be quite, you know, so severely damaged like that. However, I think overall we can take some encouraging signs from, you know, the overall performance. Even though interest in income was down, we saw that non-interest income went up, you know, quite significantly year on year. We saw that even though they made a bit of a loss on foreign exchange income in Q2, overall they still managed to, you know, do some some good business there. So I think the, the biggest signs or the most important signs is that the operating costs did not go up by by a lot. They went up by about one percent overall. Loan loss provisions stayed flat at about zero percent. And, you know, overall, they grew their profits quite significantly. However, we have to remember the fact that the, that growth in profits was also down to the fact that they, you know, divested from the insurance business, which added about almost $14 billion to their um, revenue. So that was, you know, profit, pure profit. So I think that sort of boosted, you know, or padded their performance a little bit. But looking forward to what we will see probably more towards the end of Q1 or start of Q2 with the other banks and their performances, I think, you know, our expectations are still that interest income across the board will be down, that provisions will be up, but non-interest income will also help to support and profits will either improve slightly or just or only go down by a very marginal amount. 
But overall, I mean, I've been saying this since last year that the signs are very encouraging for Nigerian banks because, you know, across West Africa, we saw a lot of, a, a, little, a far higher level of provisions and, you know, even profit warnings. But that's, that has not been the case with, with Nigeria. And I don't, I don't think that will still be the case now. Even um, UBA have already declared that um, they've sent their audited results to the CBN and are awaiting approval before they declare their dividends. So that means that, you know, we're still going to see dividend payouts across the industry, most likely. Um, and, and that was what we expected. So, yeah, I think it's encouraging signs pretty much across mm. the board. I know uh, Ali will be celebrating how what magic you folks in Nigeria are doing when it comes to the banking sector. Ali would have loved to pick a few from here because of dividend pay. Ali, just one minute on what the, you think the, the, the situation will be with East African banks uh, reporting season for full year 2020. Oh, apologies. Obviously, um, uh, we get uh, a lot of uh, uh, information. We've had the, the uh, results through September, and it's clear, and we've had this enormous figure around bank restructuring of loans, which is, I think, 1.54 trillion shillings, if I remember correctly. So, I, you know, I think the banks here in East Africa have erred on the side of trying to throw as much as they can um, into 2020 results. So to put in all the downside in there and then rebound this year. So I think on balance, we're going to see um, results. And, and we've got this dividend issue because of the central bank uh, uh, demanding that the banks essentially skip their dividends in order to rebuild strength in the balance sheet. So I think it's going to be tough. Um, but if I was an investor, I would be definitely looking to pick up um, uh, tier one uh, potentially high growth banks like Equity Bank, which has made such a foray into DR Congo, KCB, which has this regional footprint. Um, and maybe even Co-op Bank, which has a you know a, an advantage in its client base. Mm. Thank you, Ali. Uh, Temple, what about ATL earnings? Uh, you, last week, this uh, same uh, telecom giant reported paying about seventy billion to the Nigerian uh, a sector regulator for Spectrum ten-year license. Seventy billion naira, hundred and seventy-eight million US dollars. There's a whole lot of money here in telco, isn't it? Well, it looks like there is. Lately, they've been signing a whole lot of agreements with other countries and companies, you know, in different uh, jurisdictions. And uh, looks like that has really, really paid off. Uh, considering what does their earning is saying at this point, nine months revenue uh, growing to by some 21.6%. That's a plus. In East Africa, 23.4%. It's also a plus. Uh, eight point, that's 8% 8 specifically in the Francophone-speaking countries. Uh, put all of this together, it, it justifies the reason why we're saying their share price costing close in Nigeria to uh, 1,000 Naira, because I think it's around 930-something Naira at this point in time. Um, we just have to wait to see what the annual figure for the year 2020 uh, will look like. Again, the COVID-19 pandemic has redefined how uh, these guys do business. Um, it has also redefined really consumption pattern of, Niger of Africans generally uh, for all of these telcos because people now use a lot of data and uh, they consume more data, even more than voice. So all that, I think, explains the reason why we are seeing so much of destruction in their business, considering, again, the fact that they are now involved in mobile money payments and all of that. When you sum all that together, uh, it justifies the the, the the high price and interest that we're seeing on this telco. Oh, thank you, Tempo. Uh, let's touch on South Africa uh, news coming through. This morning was that uh, President Ramaphosa made this week uh, uh, lift uh, uh, what you call uh, uh, restrictions on beach and bar alcohol consumption, but it looks like the alcohol and brew industry in South Africa is already uh, damaged. Uh, Sasol, the energy giant, uh, is looking at uh, half year 2021 headline earnings per share and EPS above 100%. Uh, MTN, uh, despite taking the authorities in South Africa to, the, to court over the spectrum licensing round, it says it's donating 380 million rand 
worth of vaccines to uh, virus vaccine to the African Union under the uh, COVAX arrangement. Uh, Axelor Metal is forecasting four year 2020 headline uh, decline of 1 million rand. That doesn't look like a whole lot of money, by the way. And um, South Africa mining industry uh, says they will spend about 300 million rand in vaccine rollout for their own. Uh, 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 workers within uh, in the mines. Uh, Ali, let's uh, uh, touch on this uh, COVID-19 virus distribution uh, and what uh, MTN is bringing to the table here. It, it looks like we can use all the help or uh, support we can get. Yes, I must say I, I was very concerned and worried a few weeks ago that we had totally uh, had no sort of leverage, there was zero collaboration. Everyone was trying to do it on their own and all failing, but suddenly it seems that there's been more coordination. Um, uh, the private sector seems to be stepping up uh, with uh, this MTN announcement is one uh, I saw Standard Bank was helping as well amongst others. So look, um, I, I think there's also a realization in the developed world that uh, they can vaccinate themselves 200%. But if they don't vaccinate the rest of the world, they're still going to be at risk. Um, um, and I think I, I saw an interview with Tony Blair over the weekend, and it seems to me the penny has finally dropped. Um, uh, you know, it, the, the response in uh, the West has been very suboptimal throughout. Um, there was a lot of denial, and then, of course, we had Trump um, speaking nonsense from the podium. Um, uh, but uh, hopefully we've now got uh, a more intelligent approach um, and one that understands that if, if, if a billion, 1.3 billion people aren't vaccinated, you know, the world is not safe. And uh, I'm hoping for progress on that front. President Ramaphosa, obviously, you know, the entertainment uh, side, tourism has been absolutely hammered. Um, South Africa, I think uh, visitor rates were down 88 uh, year to date, um, it, over 12 months, um, you've heard from the brewers, they've been complaining, they've had layoffs. Um, and I think, you know, the beach and bar story is a positive step in the right direction. And also, if you look at the uh, infection rate, we're seeing a sharp slide from that spike earlier in January, with the new variant the numbers have fallen dramatically. Um, and I think uh, Ramaphosa is uh, reacting to that. Um, obviously, the concern is we'll see another spike with the virus. You know you can drop down and you can surge very, very quickly. But I think that was um, uh, informing his reaction. And the South African economy definitely needs a boost. Interestingly, I saw citrus exports hit an all-time high um, uh, out of South Africa. So there are some bright spots. Uh, we've spoken about agriculture before, um, and, uh, and South Africa is, that agri-sector is outperforming in a very, very downbeat economy, and it's worth just uh, bearing that in mind. Okay, thank, thank you, Ali. Uh, Joshua, when we talk about the vaccine rollout in Nigeria, the Central Bank uh, at the Monetary Policy Committee meeting uh, last week, uh, Tuesday spoke about supporting the government uh, further in terms of the vaccine rollout. Well, I mean, I really don't, I don't know where to even begin with regards to vaccines. First of all, um, I think the, the, the specific vaccine that we get is, is just as important as, you know, getting any vaccine due to the fact that, you know, a lot of the um, two dose vaccines need, require very, you know, cold storage. These are mRNA vaccines, they require, you know, something like minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit storage. And that would be very, very tough to do, you know, in specific rural areas in Nigeria with our, you know, very, very unreliable electricity. So I think we're probably going to, you know, source something like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is a one-shot variant, with it, which is a bit less reliable, but can be stored at, you know, much um, more realistic temperatures. However, that hasn't really, you know, completely passed all the, you know, checks and approvals yet. However... With regards to even getting any doses, at this point, where what we're looking at is, you know, a rollout, I don't even know when, maybe towards the end of the year. Um, first of all, obviously, you know, we're paying for these things in dollars. This is another cost that 
the government is, is going to have to bear. I think if we bring in, you know, private private entities and you know make maybe give them some tax incentives in order to sort of boost our um, you know by purchasing power, that might that might help. But overall, I don't know what kind of rollout plan they're going to have in place. Whether the government is going to be organized enough to even have it put a plan in place is it remains to be seen. I think that um, I'm not holding my breath with regards to Nigeria, you know, so, sort of fixing up and all of a sudden having a major tactical plan to vaccinate everybody. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not completely convinced that that's, that's going to happen very quickly. However, you know, the CBN might, you know, intervene and maybe take the reins, take control in some form or another with sourcing the vaccines and then we'll go from there. But I'm not really convinced, to be very honest with you. Okay. Thank you, Joshua. One piece of news that we uh, missed was last week was the petroleum industry bill, which was being debated at the National Assembly Temple. Uh, there were fiscals between oil communities and, and legislators who were fighting over the PIB. And then the oil companies came out and said, well, they were not well represented. They came out and wrote very lengthy, whatever they want. Do you think we will be able to see this PIB out by the end of March? The Senate president says it's going to be out this uh, quarter. Is that realistic? Well, I think because the, the, their body language at this point speaks to uh, so much of reforms, structural, st structural reforms in the uh, policy, in the economy, I suspect we will be able to get this thing out. What they really just want to do uh, with those traditional rulers will be more of window dressing, just bringing them along, let us hear from them. I believe strongly that whatever they really want to do with those guys has really been concluded. What they needed them to just do was just to come on board and just talk. Whether they had fisticuffs or had some fight or not, uh, what they plan to do will certainly be concluded and they will be able to um, uh, move forward. Um, one story that is of interest to me is uh, that of Zimbabwe, which is the uh, record of uh, $39 million uh, trade deficit uh, as exports now slides to some 7%. It is worthy of note that South Africa remains the major, major trading partner to, to Zimbabwe. Uh, the uh, value of imports now, according to analysts, is that this will continue to rise. Uh, it has been rising rather since, the, since August. And they've been making some more exports and all of that. But because if you look at the figure for November, it was more positive. They actually did more gains. The turnaround started um, in December. And that is because um, lately we've seen the whole impact of COVID-19. Going forward, you know that the vaccine will become the major uh, uh, story for everyone. And so the, by the time South Africa, South Africa is able to get the vaccine, from AU and from other parts of Africa, from parts of the world. India, they're expecting some uh, vaccines from India. Zimbabwe will be relying again on uh, uh, South Africa for delivery. And that is going to shrink their exports and beef up their uh, imports at this point in time. The figure from Zimzat this period, uh, that's the Zimbabwe National Statistics Agency, shows that total exports was $488.3 million versus $527 million in terms of exports, which is a deficit of 7%. And the, it is expected that these will continue for the first uh, uh, quarter of 2021 uh, because of the vaccine importation that will be coming from that region. And Zimbabwe won't be the only country. You're going to have other regions, uh, other countries in that region, depending on South Africa for the importation of their vaccines, which is where the focus for uh, importation and expenses will be going, going forward. What can we do without the vaccine these days? I'm not too sure there's anything we can do except sleep at night. But let, let's touch on uh, North Africa, by the way, uh, which uh, uh, was coming through with uh, Morocco's PPI, uh, which is the producer's uh, uh, purchasing uh, uh, pricing index, uh, purchasing uh, index, which is a PPI for manufacturing up 0.4% in December. And uh, the drug company, Arab drug company, PAT in Egypt, 60.28 million Egyptian pounds 
half year 2020 into 2021 and eastern african uh, company profit rises 14 percent 2.54 billion egyptian uh, pounds within the period again we have a very busy week on our hands early starting with uh, uh ghana central bank uh this week then we'll have a raft of uh pmis from uh uh, across the continent so uh, give me your take on your outlook on on pmis J uh, joshua let me start with you well okay just going from where we you know finished off last year where you know there were a few disruptions i think in december at least in nigeria with regards to pmi pmi had, had sort of declined a little bit i think for um this year to start off obviously there haven't been you know as many lockdowns although the number of cases has, has risen quite significantly, especially in Lagos and Abuja. But I think overall, across the African continent, we might start to see a little bit more um, of a ramp up in, in production, manufacturing, demand as well, just due to the fact that, you know, there will still be some optimism that this year, you know, we'll see the back of this um, pandemic. So I think based on that, and, you know, Hopefully, less disruption. We will see a ramp up in, in production. And so, I'm, I'm expecting the PMI to come in higher, month on month at least, to start off. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, uh, Ali. What's your What's your outlook on on North Africa uh, as far as uh, uh, whether it's a PMI or PPI is concerned? Do you think Egypt will still be a leader? Yes, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm I'm bullish about Egypt uh, as I've been for a while. I think. The that I have uh, around food prices. Uh, Egypt, as you know, is a very big importer of food and um, I think uh, is therefore exposed to a continued run higher in food prices that would pressure the, the Egyptian pound. Um, and uh, I don't have to tell you, but 10 years ago, you know, what the, the revolution in Egypt started uh, in part because of the increase in the price of bread. But Overall, I think uh, I, I remain constructive about Egypt. Um, I'm watching the political dynamics uh, closely. Tunisia, you, you know, people I don't really look at it very closely, but it remains problematical. There have been uh, a lot of issues around there. Um, and for now, I think, uh, and Algeria as well, where the currency has been sliding, it seems to me Egypt and Morocco are currently the stronger players in that uh, Maghreb region. Okay. Uh, Thampo, what's your take on, uh, do you think uh, Ghana Central Bank will raise interest rates or uh, leave interest rates? Uh, forecast was 15.4%. Uh, for I think I'll just go with the forecast of uh, Reuters the other time and, uh, and some other analysts that uh, were featured in this survey that uh, they have all exhausted their... Um, interest rate ammunition uh, because again if you check from april last year downwards they have all doled out uh, a, a, a serious stimulus packages for uh, smes for msmes for uh, companies generally even in the in the healthcare sector they've doled out stimulus packages and all of the stimulus packages are still very much available so this is what they will leave I don't see them making any changes. In fact, the uh, uh, European Central Bank the other day too, they didn't make no changes. That was the same thing that uh, Christian Lagarde also said, that we've already made a whole lot of um, um, ammunition available to you. Continue to use that. It is not expected that these guys will come into the markets to uh, take any further loans mm -hmm. and all of that. And what they will continue to tap into will be all of those uh, programs and schemes that have been put uh, together for this guys. Before we go, I should just add that uh, FBN Quest has now released the uh, PMI for Nigeria for January, and there's a sharp decline of I think 55 or 55 to 50, 55 uh, percent. Uh, sorry, 44.5 percent all the way from 55 uh, reading actually. So uh, this is something really worthy of uh, attention. Uh, it's something that I'm sure we'll be digesting possibly against tomorrow where we'll be able to drill down into it because as I see it, it says the reading for un for employment was again below water at 49 since GDP per head was not been positive since Q3 2015.
that is something that we'll be able to chew together here tomorrow morning. Because of I, I agree with you. Thank you so much. And of course, we also expect the Central Bank of Nigeria to release the official data by today or uh, tomorrow morning uh, at the latest to also compare. But of course, we all know, as uh, Joshua said before, uh, the, the significant uh, progress hasn't been made on the manufacturing uh, PMI front. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate your time. Joshua Debussy from Vetiva Capital. Have a great week ahead. We appreciate your time. Alec Hansachu from Nairobi, Rich uh, Frontier CEO and founder. Thank you very much. And Temple Ashaju out of London. Thank you. We appreciate uh, having all of you on the show. Have a great day, everyone. And bye for now.